Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live. This is uh, another Tuesday where you are sharing time with me on Hernia Talk Live with our questions and answers. As you know, my name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. I am your host for today and will be answering your questions with our guest panelists. You can follow me on uh, YouTube, on Facebook at Dr. Tofai, where many of you are joining me currently as a Facebook Live, as well as on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. Today's guest panelist is someone you're going to fall in love with. He's very, very lovely, plastic surgeon, very gifted, Dr. Maurice Nahabedian. He is in practice at McLean, Virginia, and you can follow him on Instagram at Maurice Nahabedian. We'll get to learn so much about him soon. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having Hi. me on your show. Thank you so much. So we were catching up just earlier. Uh, Dr. Nabedian is in private practice. He is a big time plastics person in the plastic surgery world, but also in my world, in the hernia world. We have a handful of plastic surgeons that really enjoy the abdominal wall and much of their practice seems to be geared to abdominal wall reconstruction. Um, and we learn from you all because your approach and your training is very different than a general surgeon's approach and general surgeon training. Um, so you're one of them. You're one of the top that uh, I get to meet at meetings and have gotten to know. It's, it's been a pleasure. So thank you for giving your time to us. Oh, happy to do it. Uh, it's been a... It's been a good journey for this past 25 years doing a variety of things and abdominal wall has always been one of my one of my favorite areas. Yeah, so was that part of your plastic surgery training or did you learn most of what you do now like with time? You know, when I was a resident at Johns Hopkins, we did a fair amount of abdominal wall reconstruction okay. mainly because the the general surgeons would have these complex defects, so I was exposed to it as a resident and then mm -hmm. as an attending you know, we just continued on with that. And we were actually writing papers about complex abdominal wall reconstruction using yep. flaps and various, you know, component separation techniques. Yep. Um, and then when I got to Georgetown, uh, we took it to another level when uh, Steve Evans and I started the abdominal wall reconstruction conference uh, yes. back in, in 2011. And that, that was a huge success. Um, yes. And, you know, since then, you know, we've been doing these things on a regular basis. Yeah, the AWR conference. I went to the first one in DC. Yeah. Uh, loved it. It was fantastic. It was it was revolutionary because up until then there was the America's Hernia Society, and it was just a different take. We didn't take advantage of our plastic surgery um, colleagues in learning that aspect, and you know, like the component separation was. Uh, invented by a plastic surgeon and you have all an understanding of the blood flow and the nerves and the anatomy much more than the average general by far more than the average general surgeon but also more than the average hernia surgeon I would assume because of how you do to manipulate all that anatomy right well it's all part of our training you know especially yeah. when it comes to soft tissue management and the anatomy as it relates to reconstruction, because we're so used to moving tissues around. So the whole concept of a component separation that was described by Oscar Ramirez, who's a plastic surgeon, uh, was really based on knowing where the arteries are, where the nerves are, where yeah. the muscle layers are, and what the safe planes are. And then we realized that we could actually move these tissues around in order to close some of these complex defects, uh, where historically, we would just try to close these things under tension and they looked good in the beginning, but then they would yeah, fall, apart fall apart down the road. But by doing these specialized techniques, we really took it to another level. And now, fortunately, component separation is open to the world. You know, everybody does component separations, which is really good for the patients. I mean, at the end of the day, we want our patients to have the best outcomes possible. And, you know, these are all things that we can do to help. So maybe you can spend some time answering just a, an initial question, which is related to how your work differs from the traditional or the average plastic or um, surgeon or surgeons that deal with cosmetics. So plastic surgery has to do with the cosmetic aspect, but also you have a very strong component of your training and the work that you do, which is reconstructive. 
Right. Whereas like, let's say if I go for Botox or something, that's not really reconstructive surgery, but you do something in your practice, which is even beyond. Can you just explain the difference between reconstructive surgery and cosmetic surgery? Sure. So, you know, reconstruction is really about bringing people back to normal. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. about making them beyond normal. So we don't really focus on... Um, <laughs> what do you mean? Thing, yeah, because we're, we're, I'm, I'm trained in, you know, oncology and I've always had an interest in reconstruction. But what we've done now is we've kind of blended reconstruction with aesthetics and function. So these, these three components all really go together now. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, I've always had much more you know, gratification putting people back together and taking some of these complex defects and really get a lot of satisfaction from it, mainly because my patients uh, you know, can get back to a point in their lives where they have self-confidence and esteem and can function and really integrate back into society. It's, it's not about making them super normal. It's just yeah. about bringing them back to a, a normal functional level. And when you do these operations, one of the questions I already posed is how do you minimize risk of scarring and also risk of adhesions? Can you explain what you sure. know about adhesions and also scars? Yeah. So, I mean, when I do, as a plastic surgeon, when I'm doing, when I'm involved in a, in a complex hernia, I'm usually working with a hernia surgeon as well. So I think the combination of the two has worked mm -hmm. out really well for us. Not everybody needs to do that, but that's what we do. So <laughs> when it comes to minimizing adhesions, then, you know, we, it depends on, you know, how much we have to do, you know, what type of mesh we're going to use, where we place yeah. that mesh, um, when it comes to the external scars, then I kind of take a more active role uh, yeah. and really kind of take over. So closing things with minimal tension, using uh, barbed sutures or sutures that are completely buried. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while in a real complex patient, I will have to use staples, but most of the time we're really focusing on the aesthetics and how things look on the outside. So I'll, I'll be very careful about assessing blood supply, mm -hmm. minimizing tension, doing buried sutures when possible, and using the appropriate dressings. Um, we now know that by using negative pressure type dressings over some of these complex incisions actually promotes optimal wound healing and improves the appearance of scars because we can reduce the amount of edema and swelling and drainage you know, all of which leads to optimal outcomes. So you use the vac for the wound after wound closure? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I just put a vac on last week on a patient who had a complex wound uh, wow. and it, it worked great. So not every patient will get a vac, but if there is, if I'm worried about fluid collection, soft tissue edema, um, maybe the blood supply isn't perfect, then I'll put a negative pressure device on the incisions just to kind of help things along. Yeah, so you know, I, I work in Beverly Hills. I'm in the what we call the Golden Triangle, where mm -hmm. most of your colleagues are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there's me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, they have the luxury of operating on thin patients, people who've lost a lot of weight. They're often optimized before they get, let's say, a tummy tuck. But you don't have that luxury. So many of your patients have cancer, right. uh, often breast cancer, and you use your talent for reconstructive surgery to take tissue from one area of the body and reconstruct another. So they may be obese or they may be, um, you know, have medical problems that are not necessarily optimized, but they need their cancer surgery. Right. So that, uh, by definition, you're going to have more wound complications, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know, when, when you, have something like breast cancer, or if you've had a complex hernia, oftentimes these patients, um, you know, aren't the most slender patients. I mean, they may have an elevated body mass index. <laughs> they may have larger breasts. They may have excess skin and fat around the uh, abdomen. Yeah. So they may be good candidates for what we're going to do. Um, we take all comers. I mean, if I had to kind of pick the average BMI uh, for my breast reconstruction patients who have had deep flaps or tram flaps, it'd probably be in the low 30s, but wow. I've operated on patients that have BMIs in the 40s. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, so I don't discriminate. If they're a good candidate and I think that I can get the job done, I'll go ahead and operate. Uh, so they can be I overweight, obese, or mor morbidly obese, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, if somebody is really morbidly obese, like if they come in with a BMI over 45, mm -hmm. then it gets a little bit more complicated because the risk of a wound healing complication you know, goes beyond a point that I'm comfortable with and that yes. the patient may not um, you know, benefit from. So sometimes uh, I recommend just minimizing the reconstruction or doing no reconstruction, mm -hmm. uh, let everything heal and then come back and do a delayed reconstruction uh, where I can control things a little bit more, uh, you know, optimally. Okay. So maybe you should just briefly explain what we're talking about. These are deep flaps, D-I-E-P, tram flaps, and other ways of using abdominal tissue to reconstruct a mastectomy, correct? Correct. Yeah. So Initially, these operations really started in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, they were doing what's called the traditional tram flap. And the tram flap was where we would take the skin and fat from the lower abdomen, and we would take all or most of the rectus abdominis muscle. Uh, and we would take that muscle because that's where all the blood vessels resided. Mm -hmm. So those patients would get uh, the tissue rotated up into the chest, and, but it would leave the muscle uh, void of one or both rectus muscles, which in some patients was very problematic because it could lead to a bulge or a hernia. And so then what we started- what they call a, sorry, a pedicle tram flap? Correct. Where skin fat muscle from the belly gets moved up to the contralateral, the other side of the breast. That's correct. Okay. So it's known as a pedicle tram flap. Yeah. And then probably in the late 80s, we started doing um, these uh, microvascular free tram flaps that mm -hmm. were sometimes muscle sparing. And then the deep flap, the DIEP flap, really was introduced in the mid 1990s. I started doing the deep flap in 1999. Mm -hmm. And the deep flap is oh. different than the tram flap in yeah. that no portion of the muscle is removed. We just make an incision in the muscle, separate the blood vessels from the muscle, and then detach it and then transplant it up into the chest. So the benefit of that is really for the abdomen. Uh, so it preserves the, the contour of the abdomen and the function of the abdomen. Plus mm -hmm. you get the benefit of having a tummy tuck essentially, because yeah. we're removing that excess skin and fat. So it's a, it's a double benefit. You get a new breast made of your own tissue and a tummy tuck. So the original tram flap, because you're removing muscle and you left behind with an area where there's no muscle and all you have is the, the fascia and below your belly button, there's not that much fascia. After, uh, the entire area is not all fascia. Um, were they closing it just with stitches or they were putting mesh in? How were they dealing with that defect? So it varied around the country. So yeah. there were some people who would use a mesh routinely. Uh, mm -hmm. And back when we were doing more tram flaps where the muscle was removed, people were using polypropylene meshes I or Marlex yeah. mesh. Yeah. Um, and then there were some cases where we didn't have to remove as much of the fascia and we could close the fascia primarily. Uh, and that had the benefit of one, minimal disruption, and two, the fact that we didn't have to use a mesh uh, right. if, if it wasn't necessary. Um, there were times where if there was still a little bit of a contour abnormality, we might tighten it up a little bit more and, they, and then put an onlay mesh yes. on the anterior rectus sheath or that, that fascia just to give it more support. Um, and there are times where we still do that today, even with deep flaps, just to minimize the risk of any stretching of that anterior sheath or fascia that may cause a bulge. So okay. even though we do a lot of deep flaps and we don't see a lot of hernias, we still can see a bulge, which is different than a hernia because there's no hole in that fascia. It's just uh, stretched out and it bulges a little bit. Okay, that was gonna be my next question. With a deep D-I-E-P, you're taking the skin and fat, but not the muscle. Correct. And you're not making a hole in the muscle, but I've seen patients with hernias after a deep flap. So how, what's the explanation for that? 
Well, a couple of things can happen. We, what we have to do is we have to make do a myotomy. We have to make an incision in the muscle to separate the blood vessels from the muscle. And then we take the skin fat and artery and vein, leaving the muscle behind. Now, since you've got a split in the muscle, if you don't repair that muscle primarily, there is a possibility of that muscle separating, mm -hmm. uh, creating a, a, a pathway for a, a future hernia. And if you repair the fascia and it's under tension, then that fascial repair can fall apart. Okay. Uh, and then you've got a situation where you've got the deep layers of the posterior fascia, like where the transversalis fascia is, mm -hmm. kind of poking through, coming through the muscle, through the hole in the anterior sheath, and then all of a sudden you've got a hernia with a hernia sac. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the mechanism. Um, usually it's because they've either damaged the muscle, made a hole in the muscle that they didn't repair, and then the fascia falls apart, and then you get a true hernia. Okay, and can you explain why a surgeon would choose to use mesh in some deep flaps and why other surgeons do not? If you're not making a hurt, a defect in the muscle, why use mesh with a deep flap ever? So it's really to reinforce that anterior rectus sheath. So I can okay. tell you that, um, the anterior. Okay. yeah, so what I, historically with a deep flap, I would never put an onlay mesh on um, because mm -hmm. you, really you're just repairing that anterior sheath. So we would put an onlay mesh on. I would not have to do that very often. And my bulge rate was about four to 6%. So okay. you like to think that everything's gonna turn out perfect, but at the end of the day, it doesn't always turn out perfect. You may get a bulge and a contour abnormality and the patient may not be happy with that. Right. So one of the things that we're doing now is we're placing a resorbable mesh. Uh, it's called Phasics. It's, it's yes. a poly-4 um, hydroxybutyrate mesh. It's a dissolvable yes. mesh. We lay it on there as an onlay after we've repaired everything. And that has reduced our bulge rate to about two or 3%. So um, that's why, that's one reason why um, we use a mesh now more regularly is really as a preventative um, uh, maneuver to decrease the risk of having any contour issues. So we have a patient who may be actually reacting to that mesh. Some people get systemic. We see it actually in hernias. I know there's BII, the breast implant illness. Right. Um, we don't call it MII, mesh implant illness, but it, yeah. uh, it, it is a real problem that, that I've treated a lot and we're, we're researching trying to figure out if we can predict it anyway, or at least test it anyway. We haven't been successful, but um, I personally have a pretty, large, relatively large number of patients that have this Asia syndrome or Schoenfeld syndrome, which is they, they have a systemic reaction to the mesh and the only treatment is mesh removal. If this patient that has deep flap mesh reaction, can that mesh be safely removed and with no consequences or do they need like a biologic or something else to reinforce? No, they wouldn't necessarily need anything to reinforce. If I had somebody who was having any sort of an issue and we thought it was yeah. related to the mesh, then I would go back and take the mesh out. Um, if they need, let's say they had, if they had a bulge uh, and we had to do something to remove the mesh, then what I might do is replace it with a biologic mesh, yeah. something that would probably be less reactive. Uh, but there have been situations where I've gone in and removed the mesh. Um, most of the times when that's happened, it's because of uh, an underlying infection. There might have been a little wound that started, and then the mesh uh, gets yeah. secondarily Sizes. seated, and we have to take the mesh out. Yeah. Um, but if somebody had an allergic reaction, some sort of a systemic reaction to the mesh, and that's what it was felt to be from, there was no other explanation. Then, then I would I would go in and take the mesh out, and I, I wouldn't probably put anything back in. I would just rely on the sutures right. that are holding everything together. Uh, one question is how many, or have you had any patients develop foreign body reaction from the physics? Um, there have been a couple of patients that have had wounds um, where a portion of the physics mesh got infected and I had to go back in and take the mesh out. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that the majority of patients have tolerated the phasics mesh well. 
And I know it's a little bit controversial. Not everybody will place a mesh uh, into patients after this, especially since we're putting it in prophylactically. They don't really have a, a true need for it. We're just doing it as a preventative measure. Yes. Uh, but we've had we've been very fortunate in that our outcomes have been very favorable using this. Um, there are other centers. I know that there are um, that there's a group in North Carolina that um, have reported some additional complications because of this mesh. Mm -hmm. But I guess a lot of it is really going to depend on the patient population, some of the underlying comorbidities, yeah. the techniques used. There's so many variables that uh, you know go into determining outcomes. Yeah, we just don't know. I, in my series, I've had two patients that have had reactions to biologic mesh. Yeah. Um, like pretty significant. And one of them actually, when I replaced it with just suture, even responded to the sutures. Yeah. So, of course, very rare, not expected. And phase six is a synthetic absorbable. So it's synthetic like mesh, but it's absorbable like biologics. So Theoretically, it shouldn't be that bad, but I believe it is more inflammatory in nature than an organic biologic because it is synthetic. Um, so it has a bit more of an inflammatory response. So, you know, anything is possible. These numbers are very low, um, but, you know, we have to be diligent in patients that may be suspected to have this. I have a complicated patient for you. You ready for this one? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Dr. N. In 2015, I had a true deep flap, no muscle removed, and SGAP flap reconstruction after breast cancer. What's SGAP? It's a superior gluteal artery perforator flap. It's from the upper buttock. Wow. Uh, after breast cancer, I was a thin with a BMI of 21. So that's okay. basically a normal weight person on the lower, lower end of normal. After the deep flap, I had denervation of the abdominal wall with donor site morbidity. This caused a recurring abdominal bulge with incisional and bilateral inguinal hernias. This paralyzed my anterior rectus muscles and they have thinned. Polypropylene mesh was put in and now I'm suffering from autoimmune diseases and chronic infections from the mesh. I've reached out to countless explant specialist surgeons and all have said if they remove the mesh, they have to replace it with another mesh. Given autoimmune disorders or Asia syndrome, chronic foreign body mesh rejections from mesh, I've been told to have no mesh put in. What can be done for me? Good question. Yeah, well, it sounds like a very, you know, complex situation. Um, you know, in terms of like the denervation, um, of the abdominal wall, when, even when you do a deep flap, you have to really respect the, uh, the nerves that are going into that muscle. And it, it's easy to damage those nerves. So you have to be very cognizant of where they are and then make every effort to preserve them. And every once in a while, we have to still divide one of those motor nerves. The rectus muscles, you know, segmentally innervated. In other words, the nerves come into the muscle at various different locations. Okay. But if you if you cut enough of those nerves, that muscle will stop functioning. Uh, you will become more flaccid. Uh, you'll probably develop a bulge because you've lost some abdominal support. Yeah. And oftentimes, when that happens, uh, a mesh repair is 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 usually indicated. Now, if you've had a reaction to the polypropylene mesh, which it sounds like you had, then the thing to do would be to go in, um, remove that mesh. And most of the time I would, if I, if I felt I really needed a mesh, I would use a biologic mesh. Right. Um, I think the likelihood of having any sort of an autoimmune reaction to a biologic mesh is less uh, because it's, it's essentially collagen and elastin and you know all these other structural elements that right. are normal in, in everybody's tissues. Uh, the meshes, the biologic meshes are all processed so there's no cellular elements. It's just a uh, like a matrix of all these different components. So that's typically what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, it sounds like a complicated situation, um, but that's, so yeah. So patients with denervation, like this patient, uh, they're usually the way I treat it. And, and I do these with plastic surgeons is they get an intense plication of the denervated portion. 
just to tighten it down because it's lax and really has no trigger to it. There's no function to it and, and keep stretching out. And then I do a very wide overlay onlay of mesh that covers not only the plicated tightened area of the denervated muscle, the muscle that lacks the nerves, but also covers normal healthy tissue, including areas of the body that don't move like the ribs and the, um, the uh, hip pelvis, the inguinal ligament, basically areas that you can suture the mesh to so it doesn't stretch over time. Is that's that, let's, that's... let's say this lady does not have a mesh problem. Is that what you would do if you have denervation from a deep flap? Yeah, so whenever, whenever I do an onlay mesh for yeah. somebody who's got a bulge or denervation, I, I do exactly as you said. I, I create a pocket, an abdominal wall pocket that goes to the, ed, the inferior edge of the ribs all the way down to yeah. the pubic bone and then extends mm -hmm. out towards the anterior axillary line. So the yes. entire anterior abdominal wall is going to be covered with this mesh yes. because you, you can't just put the mesh specifically over the area of the bulge or Correct. the contour abnormality. You have to extend it out um, all the way uh, towards the borders of the anterior abdominal wall. And then you have to place um, quilting sutures. You yeah. have to you have to anchor the mesh to the abdominal wall with sutures in the mesh so that when you yes. when you sit up and flex your waist, you don't get bowstringing of the mesh. So you want that mesh to incorporate to that that anterior rectus sheath throughout its entire surface. So those are all yes. those are important points. You need a wide mesh. Uh, when you have a, a bulge like that. Okay, so now in this lady's situation, sounds like she needs that, but she can't get mesh. Uh, so what's your experience in using biologic mesh for these problems? Because biologic mesh absorbs. Right. So, I mean, meshes, you know, there's pros and cons of all these, all these different meshes, resorbable mesh, synthetic mesh, biologic mesh. Biologic meshes will tend to, if, if they revascularize and incorporate, then you'll get the true benefit of a biologic mesh. But if the biologic mesh completely resorbs, then you will have lost the long-term benefit. But you may get enough short-term benefit by having this mesh stay in that plane for six months, eight months, or a year so that you develop enough scar tissue that it will provide the support you need long-term. Now, mesh, the biologic meshes will stretch over time. Anything, if you apply a force to any yeah. of these meshes, those meshes are gonna stretch. And if that intra-abdominal pressure is too high, then that mesh will stretch. And I, I've seen that you know, in the abdominal wall when I've used just a small strip of mesh, I put in a, a 16 by eight piece of mesh, the patient got a recurrent bulge, I went back in and that, the, that mesh had doubled in its size. And I took a picture of this wow, and we published it like as a case report. 25% yeah. or something like, or 50%, right? It stretched quite a bit. So um, it was a very interesting thing. And that's when I kind of realized that these biologics will stretch, you know, if given enough force. And, you know, early on in the teaching, it was that, oh, it's just all technique and they won't stretch if you're doing it right. But, you know, I did it right. I took a picture before and I took a picture after and it stretched. So... You know, no mesh is perfect. I wish we had the perfect mesh. Uh, people have thought about the perfect mesh uh, and maybe one day it will exist. But uh, for the time being, we we're, we're, we have the tools that we have and try to make the best use of them. And there's a variety of things that we can use and we try to individualize as much as possible to try to pick the right one for the right patient. Yeah, I pre-stretch the mesh before I put it in. Is that what you do? Yes. Now, some of the mesh, like the human meshes, you can really stretch them manually. Some of the other meshes, the bovine or the, you know the, the the cow meshes and the and the and the um, pig meshes are much less elastic. Uh, but anytime you can, if you can pre-stretch, that's to your advantage. But even if you pre-stretch um, and then sew it in, kind of pre-stretched, and then apply a force to that mesh over time that mesh is gonna to continue to stretch. It's just like the concept of tissue expansion. You can put a tissue expander under the skin 
and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. It's, it's amazing how much stretch you can get from skin, which is what these meshes are. They're dermis, it's skin, it, it, they're elastic in nature. And which of the biologic meshes do you use? Um, I, I don't know if we should, if you want me to name brands, but I use the porcine mesh. I, I typically would use Stratus. Um, it's the it's the biologic mesh for hernias that I have the most experience with. I've used a variety of meshes, uh, both synthetic, resorbable, and biologic. And when it comes to biologic, that's the one that I prefer. Yeah, we use, um, at Cedars, we have uh, Flex HG. Back, back in the day, I was using Alloderm, but that, which I still think is great. It just doesn't, it just stretches a lot. Um, it stretches too Flex much. Flex HD is what we have at the Cedars. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we really have Stratus, but I've, I, I've had good response with Flex HD. Question, all, all I have another question, because right. uh, we have someone who's on, on here. Um, what do you do in a patient that has abdominal wall hernias and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Oh, a connective tissue disorder. Yes, yeah. so she has a collagen deficit. And you can't put synthetic mesh in her. Uh, you know, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you have to, there's various types. Um, and I think I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think it might be the Ehlers-Danlos type four that is gonna be the most complex. Um, and there are some patients with Ehlers-Danlos that you have to be very careful when you know, talking to them about surgery because the last thing you wanna do is make them worse off. Um, so, um, if you've got certain, I'd have to go back and review all the different classifications for Ehlers-Danlos. There are some patients with Ehlers-Danlos that you can safely operate on, some that you uh, have to be very careful um, who you operate on. Um, in terms of, you know, what I would do, would I use a mesh uh, in somebody with Ehlers? Um, I might, it depends on the severity of the hernia. If I could plicate, and not have to worry about anything, or if I can get everything closed without tension, then I might choose to just do that um, uh, and have them wear some sort of an external device, um, maybe use um, you know, braided sutures to really get good tensile strength inside the abdomen. Um, but you know, she's a lot of- She's failed all attempts. tissue repair. She's failed all attempts and she's reacted to synthetic mesh. So the yeah. only option that I think she has is is like application with biologic, but I don't know how good that is if you leave a biologic as your only way, in, especially a patient with Ehlers Danlos, in addition yeah. to like a tummy tuck. Well, you don't, because you don't even know what the incorporation is going to be like um, when you use a biologic. Biologic relies on incorporation. If you don't get blood supply or recellularization of a biologic, it's going to, it's just going to basically be like a synthetic. It, it'll just be there as strong as your sutures are, and then it'll detach and won't, won't give you any support. Um, sutures, um, maybe, maybe the way to go trying to avoid mesh, but again, it would be, it's a tough one without kind of seeing the patient or without seeing photographs. Um, She's in your neck of the woods, so I may have her come see you. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to see her. Um, okay, let's see. Sorry, they started to do construction next door. Okay, so this patient we talked about with a deep flap that has mesh that needs to be removed. Yes. So she says she's still waiting for phase two due to odd symptoms she was having. Would it be appropriate to ask the plastic surgeon to remove the mesh in her phase two operation? Or does she need a specific surgeon other than the breast plastic surgeon to deal with the mesh removal? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that if, if it was somebody who had had a, a deep flap with mesh placement, I, I would uh, recommend going back to that plastic surgeon or a plastic surgeon uh, who's familiar with those operations. Um, you could go to a hernia specialist as well uh, because the hernia specialists are all very skilled and savvy when it comes to matters related to the abdominal wall. 
uh, and certainly are more than qualified to take care of these things uh, and can easily remove a mesh. Um, so I, I think going to somebody with expertise in the abdominal wall is the important part. Okay, very good. Um, are you familiar with the Myers procedure? Bill Myers up in Pennsylvania, he does uh, sports hernias and part of the reconstruction of the uh, athletic pubalgia is they redirect the angle of the rectus. So they detach the rectus muscle off its insertion from the pubic bone and then they reattach it down to the ingual ligament. Um, in your experience, does that cause any denervation, not denervation, but like, does that destroy the, the muscle in any way? Well, I think it's going to certainly compromise the function. Uh, you know, I think part of the, the rectus muscle really works on the fact that you know, its origin is at the pubic and the insertions along the costal margin and ribs. So you need those two anchor points in order to get the muscle to work and for you to be able to flex at the waist. If you detach the origin of the muscle and then insert it on the inguinal ligament, you've, you've essentially compromised the function, functionality of that muscle. So I would think that it's going to be more difficult for somebody to do things like sit-ups and things like that. So I would think there's a real trade-off in a situation like that where you detach the muscle in order to repair a, a sports hernia. Um, I, I don't, I don't know Dr. Myers, and I'm not as familiar with that procedure. Yeah. But you know, just thinking about it uh, intuitively, I don't know that I would want to have that done for myself if I had one. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't need it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's um, backtrack a little bit. Ooh. I don't want that. Wrong sharing of the screen. Okay. Um, so how exactly is what you do different than a tummy tuck? So a, a true tummy tuck, we're just removing the skin and the fat. So we basically start that operation by making an incision along the bottom uh, of the area. Uh, and then we undermine, we cut around the belly button, we undermine all the way up to the ribs uh, and to the xiphoid, which is between the, you know, at the angle of the ribs. Um, and then what we do is we cut away that excess tissue and, and um, sew everything up back down below. Um, with a tummy tuck, we don't have to cut into the anterior sheath. We do not cut into the rectus muscle. Um, with the deep flap, we do cut into those structures. So I tell patients who are having a deep flap, it's gonna look like you had a tummy tuck, but it's a very different operation uh, because yeah, we're yeah. cutting into the supportive layer with the deep flap, whereas with the tummy tuck, you do not cut into the supportive layer. So tummy tuck patients don't usually get hernias um, or bulges, uh, whereas deep flap patients are potentially at risk for those. Yeah, very true. Next question has to do with suturing. What are the risks of sutures pulling out or muscle tearing when suturing the muscle? And can that be reduced by suturing technique or suture selection? Yeah, so it's a good question. So I think when you've cut into the muscle, it's always a good idea to put a couple of sutures. And I, I basically would just use an absorbable suture just to realign that muscle. Um, and you know, patients aren't really doing anything aggressive for the first month after surgery. So that's usually plenty of time for that muscle to heal back up and kind of fuse along that cut point. Um, so it would just be an absorbable suture um, and um, yeah. that, that usually takes care of it. Next question is how does a patient with a deep or tram flap, do they even do tram flaps anymore? How do they know uh, they, if they have a hernia? <laughs> Well, you know, the first thing that you would notice is you would get a bulge, uh, and then that bulge tends to get a little bit bigger. Um, if you think you have, to differentiate whether you have a hernia or a bulge, you'd really have to see your, uh, you know, hernia surgeon or plastic surgeon. With a hernia, you're going to have a defect in the supportive layer. So you could actually kind of stick your fingers through that defect and feel the edges. Uh, with a bulge, you're not going to have that defect. Uh, you're going to have just stretching, but there won't be any what we call fascial defects. So there's no, 
there's no area where the intestines are actually poking through the fascia. Uh, with a bulge, they're just kind of pushing up on the fascia. So it's really a hernia versus bulge is going to be based on physical examination. Very good. Uh, going back to the mesh reaction, do people that react to uh, synthetic mesh are also at risk for reacting to biologic mesh? I think in my experience, the reverse may be true. If you react to something as non-reactive as biologic mesh, then you'll react to a lot of things. Whereas reacting to synthetic mesh doesn't necessarily mean, in fact, it may imply you would need a biologic mesh because you're much less likely to respond to that. What are your thoughts on that? I, I completely agree. I think you're more likely to have a reaction to a synthetic than a biologic. You can have reactions to both. Um, I mean, certainly in the breast reconstruction world where we use uh, things like alloderm in the breast, we can see a phenomenon known as red breast syndrome, um, where patients may actually get red and inflamed because of there's an inflammatory response, maybe an allergic response. It hasn't really been completely elucidated, um, but it, yeah. it is still possible to have reactions to biologic, but they're, they're less frequent. I mean, this is something that happens maybe one out of 500 or one out of a thousand patients where you'll get this red breast yeah. syndrome. The same phenomenon can occur in the abdomen. You know, I've seen people use Galaflex, which is basically Phasix for the breast reconstruction. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so Galaflex and Phasix are exactly the same. They're just uh, marketed and distributed by different com companies. You're right, Galaflex is for the breast and Phasix is for the abdomen. Um, I've used both products, Galaflex in the breast and Phasix in the abdomen. And honestly, they've worked okay. Um, I use Galaflex when I need support, um, like if I'm doing a mastopexy and it, there might be a little bit more weight uh, that would maybe result in recurrent ptosis or drooping, I may put something like Galaflex to support that lower pole. Or if I need to maintain implant position in somebody who's had uh, breast implants or breast reconstruction with implants, I could use Galaflex to give me support where I need it. So it, it's it's worked well. Do you need to you? Oh, we already discussed that. <laughs> what are your thoughts and concerns when you see a patient with a hernia after breast reconstruction flop? Because that is a complex operation now. The anatomy is very different. The reaction of the, of the, what you have left to deal with is different. You have less muscle, maybe a fascia problem. So when you see a patient that may have a hernia after a tram or deep flap or other reconstruction, what are your thoughts and concerns before you treat them? So a lot of what I'll, what I would do, I mean, I first do an examination, um, find out how long this hernia has been there. Uh, is it getting bigger? Um, what sort of functions does the patient have? Make sure that they're healthy and in good physical health. Um, if they've had a one-sided, if it was a unilateral tram or a bilateral tram, that's going to be important because if they took one muscle, that's one thing. If they took both muscles, then it becomes really challenging because that eliminates the possibility of doing um, an anterior component separation because you don't really have that rectus muscle. Now, you could still perhaps do a, um, a, a TAR procedure. Um, I've had situations like this where we had no muscles, the skin was tight, I had to put in tissue expanders into the subcutaneous uh, space adjacent wow. to the defect, stretch the skin, but also stretch the internal muscles, and then come back uh, and move that skin around. But you have to use a mesh in these cases. It's, it'd be very difficult to repair a, a large tram bulge in somebody who's got no rectus abdominis muscles without using some sort of tissue rearrangement or mesh to reinforce. Um, I've done it before. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's complex, but I've done it before with tissue expanders and mesh, and it's actually worked pretty well. You know, I saw the patient for up to two years following surgery and, you know, she was flat. Um, and prior to that, she had a large, uh, a large hernia. It was a true hernia. So 
but again, I worked with um, I worked with our hernia surgeon, uh, so that we we do this team approach on some of these complex cases. It's so uh, necessary, and, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I I like you know I don't want to always take it on myself. Sometimes I like operating with other surgeons. Uh, yes. One, it it's makes like a the operation. Club. Yeah, it makes the operation yeah. a lot more fun, and you can bounce things off one another. And I think it's really good for patient outcomes. And I think studies are starting to demonstrate that kind of this team approach works really well. Yeah, I love it. And one of the things that I, I push uh, on Hernia Talk is, is how important teamwork is. Uh, Hernia Talk kind of represents what I do, which is working with different specialists for one purpose of improving someone's hernia related problem. So yeah, I think it's very fun to do that. Operate with a plastic surgeon, a urologist, gynecologist. And I learned so much because so much of our medical training is vertical. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, most of my friends don't know what I'm talking about right. because they don't have the privilege of operating with others or seeing patients of the, the variety that I do in my specialty. Um, you know, they do gallbladders and hernia, hernias and stuff, but it's not as multidisciplinary. And I feel that the patients really, really benefit when there's, when they see me, let's say, like today I had a patient. She clearly needed a tummy tuck. She came to me with a belly button hernia. And, um, you know, the I knew enough to be able to educate her a little bit about, you know, what to look for and what kind of, what's important and guide her a little bit uh, before she just goes cold into a, a plastic surgeon's office, not knowing what to ask and, and so on. So, you know, it's fun. Yeah, it is. No, I mean, it's... Uh, never underestimate the, the the benefits of you know teamwork, like you mentioned. It uh, it, it definitely improves outcomes. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, more questions are are in. Do patients who have undergone multiple abdominal operations have a thinner abdominal wall than normal? So let's say someone's had multiple laparotomies. Are they likely to have any type of thinning of their abdominal wall, or not necessarily? It it's possible. It just depends on you know, what approach was made with these operations. Certainly if you make an, an, a midline incision and go through the linea alba, um, then it's probably unlikely that you're gonna denervate anything and you're not gonna really be going through the thicker fat layers. Um, you're not going through the muscle. So those, that, that area probably won't have much of a consequence. Now, if you start making what we call right. paramedian incisions where you're actually going through the muscle and dividing the nerves and damaging the blood vessels, then you can get thinning. And then you're going to be predisposed to getting a bulge, a contour abnormality, or a hernia. Uh, and if you do transverse incisions, um, then you know, you're know you dividing muscles, you're cutting nerves. Um, denervation is going to be more of a problem and thinning could be a potential consequence. So, um, you know, there's a lot of theories on what the optimal incisional approach is for patients having abdominal surgery, um, some of which may increase the risk of a bulge or hernia, some of which may decrease the risk of a bulge or hernia, but um, it is possible to have thinning. You know, um, when we're taught to operate on the abdominal wall, we usually focus on sutures in the fascia. We're taught that, you know, don't put sutures in the muscle, it doesn't hold, but you do put sutures in the muscle. So are we being taught the wrong thing or it's just, you have to be very careful how to suture muscle? What, what do you say? Yeah, well, so we're putting sutures in the muscle, you know, when we're splitting the muscle after we do a deep flap, but it depends on what you're doing the operation for. So if you, if you really want strength and support of a repair, then you're better off putting your sutures in like the fascia. Um, so you can, you know, get good fascial, um, you know, bites, because that's where your strength layer is. Just like your, your strength layer is going to be in the dermis. It's not going to be in the fat. Uh, but so you really want to grab on to those areas that have, you know, high collagen density uh, and, and tensile strength to withstand the forces that are pulling them apart. Um, but that said, you know, we will go into the muscle sometimes with the sutures and take a bite of fascia and muscle just because we can get more purchase that way. In other words, get a, a, a better bite of the tissue, yes. you yes. know, 
for lack of a better word. Um, so we will we will go into the muscles sometimes, but that it's really the the, the strength layers that you want to get. Yeah, true. Um, when you do component separation, can you get nerve damage? Oh yeah. Um, so if you do component separation is an interesting operation because you're there's we talked about the rectus muscles the paired midline muscles that go up and down there's another set of muscles called the oblique muscles um, that are basically exactly the way they are they're they're oblique they're they're coming in towards the rectus muscles so when you do a component separation you have to get between the right layer um, so there's like the the um <clears throat> transversus, um, and then um, the um, anterior oblique. So you want to get between the first two layers because that is where it's a avascular plane. If you get between the second and third layers, that's where the nerves are. So you don't want to get into that layer because right. you'll damage the nerves. Um, and you know there have been some good studies on that. I mean, Alfie Carbonell did that study where he was kind of doing an anterior component separation was, but was between, you know, the second and third layers uh, and commented kind of indirectly about, you know, possibly having injured nerves, but, you know, not knowing yeah. if it happened for sure. Yeah. So you, you just want to stay in the right plane so you can minimize or avoid nerve damage. Yeah. We've definitely seen patients who've had nerve damage from, um, component separation. I see a lot of people with nerve damage after lateral spine yeah. approaches and kidney operations, um, yeah. aortic operations, any kind of lateral flank. Those are tricky. It used to be, we would say, you know, sorry, can't do much about it. It's not a hernia. You know, you're going to have to live with this very just deforming bulge, but um, we've had really great success with the kind of combo me and a plastic surgeon doing a pretty extensive plication with onlay. The onlay, right. the plication has to be intense and the onlay has to be very wide and just very critical, uh, stable structures. And, you know, our patients are many years out are still symmetric and doing well. So it works really well. Yeah, those are some of the most challenging. Those, you know, flank hernias from, you know, <clears throat> where, where, you know, nephrectomy scars, you know, where they go through those oblique muscles and damage the nerves. Uh, and you're right, you got the you have to put a wide mesh and you have to anchor it to bone sometimes, you know, in order to really yeah, absolutely. that mesh. Yeah. I think that's part of the key of us not having any recurrences is we do anchor it to to bone. Yeah. Um, prevents yeah. it from yeah. stretching out with the muscles. Another question on the same line of denervation is interesting. I didn't, I didn't expect this many denervation questions. After mesh placement for a large incisional hernia, can the rectus abdominis denner um, denervation or ischemia lead to loss of functionality. Well, first uh, of all, you shouldn't get you shouldn't no. get denervation as part of an incisional hernia repair. Um, but go ahead. <laughs> What's yeah, your but I, you know, you it's if you denervate that rectus muscle, and, and the way you denervate a rectus muscle is you have to basically cut on the lateral aspect of the muscle because those nerves to the rectus muscle come in laterally and then go under the muscle and then pierce the muscle at the junction of the uh, lateral and, and central third. But if you if you get on the edge of the muscle and cut those intercostals, you will denervate the muscle and you will lose function and, and you'll you could end up with like a prune belly, you know, because you just have no tone to your abdominal wall because the rectus muscle is completely denervated. So that's so why you, yeah with a deep flap um, you really have to be careful. You have to preserve the nerves. If you're not preserving the nerves with the deep flap, then you are not doing the patient a service by not taking the muscle because then you're defunctionalizing the muscle. So true. Yeah. So, and with a hernia, you know, the straightforward midline hernia, the risk of denervating the rectus muscle is probably pretty low unless you're undermining in an area where you shouldn't be undermining like between that second and third layer of the obliques. We have another great question. Can liposuction, especially of the flanks, cause denervation? It's pretty unusual. And the reason is because motor nerves are not, motor nerves are the nerves that innervate the muscle. Those are not traveling in the anterior fat compartment. 
you know, the motor nerves are coming off the spinal area and then uh, going between the muscles and staying within the muscle layer. What, what you'll see with sensory nerves is the sensory nerves will then come up through the fascia and then go to the skin. So with liposuction, you can damage some of the sensory nerves, but you shouldn't damage the motor nerves unless your cannula is in the wrong place. Um, so you could, because it's blind, you can't see exactly. where the cannula is. If you put that cannula into the muscle and start going back and forth, you can do some real damage. So I've seen that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, surgeons have to be very aware where the tip of the cannula is. Um, and, you know, in, in the worst case scenario, you can have somebody with a diastasis recti. Uh, and then, you know, have a little bit of a midline bulge because you got thin tissue and somebody does liposuction, goes right through the diastasis and you can actually perforate bowel. You know, oh, so, absolutely. Seen yeah. that too. Yeah. So you, there's a lot of things you have to be careful of. Uh, so it's really important for surgeons to do a real thorough physical exam, make sure you don't have a diastasis. And if you do, make sure you don't go anywhere near that with your liposuction cannula. Yeah, so uh, in LA, liposuction in women, but also a lot of men, and they like to have that kind of upper midline kind of indentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they liposuck yeah. through the belly button. That's this like vertical line to give you that that like in like Out athletic look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, they're like, get a hernia. I'm like, that's not a normal place to get a hernia. And he didn't tell me that, oh, by the way, I got liposuction. Um, and I'm like, it's exactly the width of a liposuction cannula. Right. And I asked him, because I'd seen it before. I'm like, have you had liposuction? He's like, yeah, I've had some work done. I'm like, <laughs> the hernia was caused by this. Right. And yeah, it's, uh, I've also seen it where they've gone through the abdominal wall and I technically, I guess you can have damage, not just by bleeding, but also by denervating or get a hernia. I've seen hernias, not just the midline where there's no muscle, but on the sides um, where they did liposuction. You know, what are your thoughts on lipo? I feel like it's a, it's one of those operations that's really hard to do a really good liposuction. And everyone kind of offers it, but I feel that it should only be done in the hands of these people that are really good at it. Otherwise you get this lumpy, bumpy, cottage cheese looking. Um, and, and I must say most of the plastic surgeons in my town don't do good liposuction. And we have a handful of dermatologists that do amazing liposuction. Like that's all they do. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, I think liposuction from a technical standpoint is not that difficult, but from an artistic standpoint yes, it is. Exactly. Um, so to, to really do it well, you have to understand um, the fat, the fat layers, the different types of fat, the different types of cannulas that you can use. You can use small bore cannulas with certain holes. You can use large bore cannulas. And it's like, it's like golfing. You know, you don't play golf with one club. I love you know, when that. You're doing liposuction, you really have to know the anatomy and you have to use your tools properly. Um, you know, you have power assisted machines, you have just handheld, you have to know how to, to mess, infiltrate that space. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's so many, there's so many little things that we take for granted, but if you take shortcuts, you're going to compromise outcomes. Yeah, I agree. I have some plastic surgeons I work with who refuse to do lipo because they've seen the outcomes long term. It's just that, like I can do a better job surgically than uh, with lipo, and uh, many people don't need the lipo. I don't know. It's one of those things that uh, a lot of people are like, "Oh, I'll just do a little lipo," but then yeah. it just doesn't look good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like anything, it's just you know, <laughs> you got to have the the right background, the right experience, and, you know, really understand what you're doing. And, and anybody, I mean, I've seen dermatologists do beautiful liposuction. I've seen plastic surgeons do beautiful liposuction, but I've also seen bad liposuction. So. Yeah. yeah, I feel it's like hernias. I would think that was just a hernia or just lipo. But, you know, when it goes wrong, it's it's really hard to, to reverse. 100% correct. Yeah. All right, my friend. Thank you so much for this. I really learned so much.
I'm going to send you this one patient for sure. I think you can help her. All right. Or at least Happy give her some of your experience. Um, I wish I were there so we could operate together. Maybe I need to come there. I know. Well, you one of these days we'll have to I'll set it up. We'll operate together. <laughs> yeah. Well, with we we'll get Sharon and you know you and me, we'll have we'll have a good yeah. time with the operating room. Or I'll have Sharon do my part. We'll see. I really want to help this patient. Okay. Well, that's the end for us tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This wraps up another hour, another week of Hernia Talk Tuesdays. Thank you to all of you who joined us by Zoom and also Facebook Live. We answered almost all your questions tonight. Um, if you do uh, want to watch us again or share it, I'll make sure that uh, our YouTube channel is uploaded with this, this webinar and I'll share all of the links on my different social media channels, including Facebook at Dr. Tofi, Instagram and Twitter at Hernia Doc. Thanks everyone. And please thank you, Dr. Nahabedian for your time and hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you very thank much. You. Take care. Bye-bye everyone. Bye.